Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That's not too bad, but I think you could do just a little bit better than that. So let's try it one more time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Amp it up a little bit. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next month. Take care. <laughs> Let me introduce myself to you formally. I'll do a little bit of it now, and we'll do more of it as the presentation continues. If you don't know already, I'm the one who's doing the presentation. <laughs> Don't know how you could tell, huh? And my name is Robert Landau, and I'm originally from New York City. Yay. <laughs> Not even a smidge of applause. Thank you. Oh, my people, my people. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about me as the time goes on, but suffice it to say that I make my home out of the woodlands here in Texas. I'm a national motivational speaker, speaking on many different topics in the Houston metro area, but also around our great country as well. And the presentation that I am privileged to be able to present to you today is one of my signature pieces because it has a very personal connection to me and who I am, as you will soon find out more. This is my latest book, which will soon be published, called You Are the Captain of Your Ship, and deals with a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. How about going on a cruise right here and now? What do you say? Yeah. That's right. And with that in mind, how many of you have cruised before? My goodness, just about everybody. Well, today's cruise is a very brief one. We will be visiting three, count them, three ports of call. Our first stop is number one. The port of call is called what you think happens. What every ship captain knows. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. Port number two, after we sail away from port number one, is this. How to thrive in difficult situations. How to steer your ship through any rough sea. And finally, number three, very important, fun stuff. Love that port of call. Because life is too short to be way too serious. So many of you are wondering what we're going to be doing here today. It's a combination of three things. One, lots of interesting information. I hope you will find it to be so will be shared by me to you. Uh, the other is it's going to be motivational a bit in nature because that's who and what I am. And three, we're going to combine those first two with a large dose of fun, with a large dose of fun. So are you ready? Yeah. Good. Good, me too. First part of call, as you might remember, is what you think happens, what every ship captain knows. And I'd like to preface this part of call by sharing this quote with you. It goes like this. Thoughts become things. If you see it in your mind, you will hold it in your hand. And here's proof. Here's a little bit more of my story. As some of you who have been coming to this monthly series already know, I was an actor in New York City for a number of years. And just when things were starting to break for me, I decided I didn't want to go for it anymore. I mean, I was auditioning for leads in major motion pictures, and I thought, something about this really doesn't fit concerning me and it. And I finally figured out what it was. That screen that you have in your homes, maybe even in your bedroom, that larger screen that you place yourself in front of when you go to the movies, to me, those screens are some of the most powerful teaching tools ever known to man. Why? Because we will do whatever it says. We will think the way it wants us to think, and so on and so forth. So suffice it to say, I didn't want to be an actor having the lead or so in Halloween 6, <laughs> modeling that kind of stuff for, for example, our nation's youth to grow up and imitate. So I was looking for an alternative. How many of you are familiar with the island of Manhattan? 
If you are, you'll probably know what this is when I say the East Village. The East Village was where I was living at the time. And every morning at 6 a.m. without fail, I would wake up and walk just a couple of blocks to the East River. And there's a wonderful jogging path along the East River. So every morning at 6 a.m., I would jog along this path that uh, parallels the East River. The East River, if you don't already know, smells horrible. <laughs> but it didn't matter to me because I was getting some exercise. But while I was doing this, I kept thinking to myself habitually, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I have no clue. I have all this acting training, so on and so forth, but I don't know what the next step is. I kept asking the question, and then I remembered the quote that I just shared with you a couple of moments ago. And another way to rephrase that quote is, if you think it, what? You will hold it in your hand. You will eventually see it. Another way to phrase that is, ask and it is given. So I asked, with the full intention to receive, not what it was that I wanted, but what it was that I needed. There's a difference between those things. And one day, as I was jogging along this path, I got it. I got it just like that. No longer that morning did I feel like I was jogging along the path of the smelly East River, but instead, as if by magic, I felt that I was on the promenade deck of a brand new cruise ship plying the refreshing waters of the Atlantic Ocean. And I thought, wow, thank you. What a great idea. So now, I'm going to put that quote to use. And every morning at 6 a.m., as I was jogging along this path, I would make believe and pretend that I was jogging around the promenade deck of a brand new cruise ship, plying the refreshing waters of the Atlantic Ocean. Three weeks later, what do you think happened? Mm-hmm. Specifically, I got a call from a friend early on a Sunday morning. I didn't even know how she had my number because we weren't that close. And she said, Robert, I need to start this off with an apology. I hate to bother you so early Sunday morning, but I have a question I need to ask you. And don't laugh at me when I ask this question to you. And I said, no, 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 friend, go ahead. And she goes, Robert, I feel moved to ask you the following. Would you like the name and a phone number of an entertainment agency here in New York City that puts cruise staff and entertainers on cruise ships? How do you think I reacted? What do you think I said? Yes. By a show of hands, how many think I said, well, yes. <laughs> By a show of hands, how many think I said, well, thanks, Rand, but I may have been thinking about it, but that's really not for me. Uh-huh, uh-huh. By show of hands, how many really don't care what I said? <laughs> hey! You know what? There's always a bunch, and they're in the front row, I say. Usually they're way up on the balcony when you can't see them, but <laughs> there's no balcony here, right? Well, for those that care, I actually said yes. Thank you so much, Fran. And she gave me the number. That was Sunday, first thing Monday morning. I called this entertainment agency and I said, hello, my name is Robert Landau. Do you have any assistant cruise director positions on any of the ships that you put staff on? What do you think they said? Yes. They said no. <laughs> <laughs> they said no. And then I was thinking of that quote and I thought, well, great. So it really doesn't work, does it? And I was just about to hang the phone up when they said, no, 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 don't hang up. We have a couple of questions we'd like to ask you. Are you ready, Robert? And I said, sure, fire away. And they said, okay. Question one, Robert, have you ever been on a cruise ship? And I thought, well, yikes. This is a job interview. 
You don't want to start a job interview with a negative. But I'm an honest person, and I had to answer no. So I said no, and I said, hey guys, thanks so much, I can tell where this is going. They said, no, 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 don't hang up. Let's go on to question two. Uh, since you haven't taken a cruise before, Robert, uh, do you know what a socializer is? And I said, a socializer? Yikes, I'm going to have to say no again. And they said, okay, you may be thinking of hanging up now, but don't hang up one more question, one more question. Since, Robert, you have never taken a cruise and you don't happen to know what a socializer does on a cruise ship, do you know how to dance? And I thought, yes, yes. Why? Because this was the 1980s and disco was the rage. Had I been to Studio 54, oh my God, yes, so many times, you can touch me if you like. <laughs> so I said, well, yes. And they said, great, this is Monday. We want to see you in our offices first thing in the morning, Tuesday morning. We think we have a position we would like to talk to you about. See you then. Couldn't sleep that night, was there 9 a.m. sharp. They opened the door of this amazing penthouse suite that you could see all of Manhattan from, and they said, Robert, good morning. We're very glad to see ya. You're on time. You are prompt. This is exactly the way we like things done on cruise ships. Three questions we'd like to ask you. Have you ever taken a cruise? No. Do you know what a socializer is? No. Do you know how to dance? Yes. They said, good, you're hired. <laughs> And into my very willing hands, they actually put a round trip ticket between New York's LaGuardia Airport and sunny, balmy Fort Lauderdale Airport because I was gonna be the socializer on a brand new cruise ship plying the Atlantic Ocean called the MV Atlantic, actually, for three weeks as a socializer. There was one huge problem with that. I had no idea what a socializer was. <laughs> so all of you, pretty much many of you at least, are avid cruisers. Can you, learned souls, give me the job description of what you think a socializer does on a cruise ship? What do they do? Yes, sir. They're there to, um, to say, um, build, build the room, as it were. Oh. I love that. I've never heard that description before. If you didn't hear what he said, he said, well, a socializer is there on a cruise ship to build the room. I love that. Huh. Let's focus it a bit more. Yes, ma'am. I thought it was to pay attention to women who are alone. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, it's getting a little hot in here, isn't it? And if you didn't hear what she said, she said, <laughs> She said uh, she thought a socializer was someone who pays attention to women on the ship who are alone. <laughs> My dear, you are 150% correct. So here, without further ado, is the job description of a socializer. A socializer is a gentleman who dances with every single, single lady on board a ship without fail, in my case, between the hours of 6 p.m. and 2 a.m. with a 30-minute break for dinner. <laughs> and any time a socializer sees a single lady alone, he goes up to her and says, Hi, I'm the socializer on board. Would you like to dance? Sure. God, I thought you were going to get up and leave. No, I'm glad you're staying. <laughs> I'm glad you're staying. I don't bite. Yeah, this microphone actually prevents me from doing that. Usually I do, but, but this, is, this is a whole different situation. Yes. And so, yes, you bring her up to the dance floor, and what kind of dance are you expected to do with her? Jitterbug, waltz, cha-cha, tango, merengue, everything that Fred and Ginger used to do, I had to do better. Could I ballroom dance, do you think? No, you're starting to get the drift of this, aren't you? No, I couldn't. And my first night on board was my first night on the job. And I remember picking the lounges, uh, the uh, ship's second largest lounge, the Bermuda Lounge. And when you walk into this thing, it had a mile long bar. And that to me was like walking the plank. 
because I knew once I got to the end of it, what would be there? Not water with sharks, but something very similar, the dance floor. And I stepped on the dance floor with my big toe, and I kid you not, about 40 single ladies, all over the age of 95, <laughs> charged at me. And you know what happens when you put a little bit of food into a huge tank of rabid piranha fish? There was a struggle. Those ladies were fighting over me over me, and one of them proudly won me, and she escorted me up to the dance floor, at which point the band <laughs> breaks into a wild, impassioned tango. <laughs> and she looks at me and she says, come on, honey, let's dance. <laughs> it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare because there were over 300 single ladies, all over the age of 95, on that cruise, and just one socializer in those days in his 20s who had no idea what he was doing, plus that agency in New York City didn't tell me to bring clothes that would make me look like I was part of the cruise staff, blue and white, right? I was wearing my own clothes. I was in my 20s, not the age that a socializer usually is. A socializer on a cruise ship is usually a retired guy who knows how to dance. <laughs> so when the other passengers saw me coming up constantly to all of these single ladies on the ship, what do you think they thought I was? <laughs> ah, yes, the dreaded G word. My reputation was formed without me even saying anything, you see? My saving grace was the fact that we did have a Fred and Ginger on board, a dance team that was part of the entertainment package, kind of like Dancing with the Stars dance teams. And they would open a lot of the formal night shows. And my third night out, they saw me dying on the dance floor, <laughs> right? And they came up to me and just, it, it was like I saw angels appear in front of me. And they said, uh, Robert, uh, my name is Francois, and this is Tony Ann. Uh, we are the resident dance team on board, and we, we kind of heard about you. <laughs> and now we've seen you in action. So just uh, consider this. We have a proposition for you. During the times at sea, when the three of us are free, we would like to offer you, could I have a drum roll, please? <laughs> Complimentary ballroom dance classes, as you said. We worked feverishly into every night, and I became the Fred Astaire of the Seven Seas. Three weeks became a season. Next season, that cruise line asked me back as an assistant cruise director. Did that for a number of years, and one day, during a day at sea, while I was in the process of selling my 80,000th snowball jackpot bingo card, I had another revelation. And the revelation spoke to me. And it said, hey, uh, Robert. The, the revelation was from the Bronx. <laughs> They're very powerful when they come from the Bronx, you know. And it said, hey, uh, I, 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 hey, yous, I want, I want you to consider something. Since you got all of this acting training that you ain't using now, why don't you forget about being an assistant cruise director? and go for the big time. You can do it. Why don't you be a cruise director? And I thought, my goodness, I'm so well taken care of. I truly am never alone in life. And I said, thank you. I am in much gratitude for that, because that is a great idea was too young to be a cruise director on the big ships in those days, so I left the big ships and started with the small, and went back to the big ships, the MV Atlantic, actually, as a cruise director, and stayed with ships all around the world for close to 10 years. Here's what it looks like stat-wise. I have uh, visited close to 300 ports of call, 
on 400 cruises. I have tangoed with over 7,500 very patient women. I have called 12,600 games of bingo. You know the captains welcome aboard cocktail parties? I have shook over 34,000 hands at those captains welcome aboard cocktail parties. I have crossed the equator 42 times. I have emceed over 252 masquerade balls. And actually the list goes on and on. Who is that? <laughs> By a show of hands, how many think that might be me? <laughs> By a show of hands, how many think that's somebody else? Somebody else more attractive and, and cultured than me. Oh good, nobody put up their hand. How many think that's Phyllis Diller? <laughs> that is actually yours truly. And since this is called Amazing Confessions of a Cruise Director, here's one of them for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to meet Harry the Hairpiece. <laughs> By the time I became Cruise Director, I was really thin on top, and us actors are very full of ego. And I thought that cruise ship passengers wouldn't want to see me MC shows at night in a spotlight with this reflecting back. So I went to Hair Club for Men on Madison Avenue in New York City and got Harry. Harry was wonderful. Most of the time people couldn't tell Harry was Harry because you put a stocking on your head, right? And into that stocking is woven real life human hair. Right? And it is dyed to match the color of your hair on the sides. And it clips into that hair. The only problem is you sign a contract for monthly treatments on Madison Avenue. Right? They re-dye the hair, they add, they take away, they trim. What do you do when you're cruise directing with cruise series out of Hong Kong and you can't make it to Madison Avenue every month because your contract forbids you to do it? Harry started to oxidize right? Because cruise ships follow the sun. He started to turn a wonderful shade of orange, and then he, he <laughs> manufactured that and changed that into green. Green. So Hair Club for Men sent me a bottle of black ink, and every two weeks I would have to take Harry and dump him into my sink in my cruise director's stateroom and squirt the ink on him, and he was okay until I would go out on deck during a day at sea, a very windy, balmy day at sea, and Harry would blow up, and he would not blow back down when I would walk in. Oh, let me tell you, it ain't fun. It ain't fun, can I get an amen? Now, here are some shots of me during my socializer days, and that was my real hair. That was my real hair, real mustache as well. These were some of the first cruises that I did as a socializer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You remember when those ties were in? Yeah, they came back in in the 80s. When I became cruise director, I graduated to the big time activities. This, some of you might have seen, it's called the newly and not so newly wet game. It's amazing to me what cruise ship passengers will do for a cheap bottle of champagne. <laughs> the questions that I put these couples through, I, I just, I still can't believe it actually worked, but it did. Masquerade balls, I saw more orphan annies than I ever wanted to in my lifetimes. Welcome aboard cocktail parties. Here's another amazing confession. Do you know, dear cruise ship passengers, how colossally boring that night is for officers like me and them? Here you have the, the top brass of a cruise ship. You have the hotel manager. You have the cruise director and Harry. You have the captain and my hostess. And you know what happens, right? Whether you're first sitting or second sitting, you are early before the, the doors of that lounge open up and you line up. She's out there to line you up two by two and you're in your finest. This is the penultimate night of excitement on any cruise. Why? Because you are going to meet 
the master of the ship. And the tension begins to mount as the lounge doors open at 6.30 sharp. And there is Luciana Trevisan, a hostess of mine, standing there going, Well, good evening. Don't you look incredible? My question to you is, are you ready now to meet the captain? And you can barely contain yourself. You're literally shaking. And you go, why, 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 yes, Miss Trevisan, we were ready. We've been waiting for this moment for months. Please announce us. And she goes, OK, may I have your name, please? And you go, yeah, Mr. and Mrs. Steinberg. And she says, Mr. and Mrs. Steinberg, I would like you to meet Captain Mario Palumbo. And just as your hand embraces his and there's a meeting of the minds there, what happens? Something happens, and it is literally a gold mine. This is another confession. It is literally a gold mine for a certain vendor on the cruise ship. Photograph, right? As soon as your hand meets his, flash, right? Everybody wants that shot because they want to put it in their scrapbook as a lasting memento of this night when you looked your best and you met the master of the ship. Now, this is what the chief purser and I would do. We had the very same sick sense of humor. And to pass the time, because literally, we were there for two hours during first sitting, and then we were there for another two hours during second sitting, right? We, he and I, would make jokes about the passengers coming through. <laughs> Very nasty, evil jokes, because we would try to make each other crack up, just to bring some levity into the situation. It worked to the point where we would often be so out of control that by the time the captain put her hand in mine, I could barely just say hi. <laughs> Mrs. Steinberg, I'd like you to meet the, <laughs> the, the, the chief purser. And he would say, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, come on in and, and have some champagne and caviar. What we didn't realize, the chief purser and I, was these were the photos that you would be putting into your scrapbooks. So there were some horrible shots of he and I, just very disrespectful. Uh, here are some of them. Look at the captain. <laughs> he was so upset that he was not included in any of this. Look at, I had just told the chief purser a colossally horrible joke, probably about one of these people. Look at the captain. He's giving the photographer a really nasty look. And right after the shot was taken, the captain jabbed me in the ribs and said, stop having more fun than me. <laughs> Some of you, I'm sure, have participated. <laughs> oh, this gets better, let me tell you. You'll be so glad you came. Some of you probably have participated in an incredible evening of fun and games on the ship. Yeah. Well, this is something that if you ever participated in, you would never forget, and this is how it works. My crew staff in a packed lounge like this for fun and games would be instructed by me to go out and find 10 gentlemen. Right? And I would stand center stage, and five guys would be lined up on this side of me facing you, another five on this side facing you, and then the staff would go back out in the crowd and find ten ladies who did not know those guys. And they would bring them up on the stage and place a lady in between each guy. So now you had Team A here and Team B on this side of me. Then, to make matters even more interesting, you are loving this, aren't you? <laughs> Look at, he's on the edge of his seat and I haven't even gotten through the whole explanation. Okay, Can you do something to calm him down? I'm yeah, I'm almost there. I'm almost there, okay. yeah. Well, then the crew staff brings a long, kind of like yardstick with yards of mm, rope wrapped around it, coarse rope, right? Yards and yards and yards and yards and yards. And at the end of this rope is tied a spoon, right? Team Captain A gets that, Team Captain B gets another one of those, and then when I give the cue for the orchestra behind me to start playing, 
each team captain has to take that spoon and plunge it into their clothing. And then, oh yes, oh yeah. Oh, now she's getting excited, yeah. <laughs> and that spoon, you would have to have come out of your dress at the bottom or your pant leg at the bottom, and then you give it to the person next to you, and they would have to thread themselves, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so forth, all the way to the end of the line. Once it gets to the end of each line, what do you think happens then? Yeah, they've got to take it out of each and the team that does this the quickest. What does each team member win? A cheap bottle of champagne. Now, I forgot to tell you one very important thing, and I brought this along if you'd like to do this today. <laughs> the person next to you, who, mind you, you do not know, has every right to help you with your spoon if it should get stuck along the way. What a wonderful way to meet people. I'm telling you, lasting relationships have been forged and are still going strong because of a game like this that was facilitated by moi. Oh, we've got some takers here, huh? So yeah, here you can barely just see it, but here's like the, the string, right? And there's the spoon, actually. And it's so funny because nobody knows what is going on. It's just mayhem. Look at this. So it's all threaded here. Look at her. She's helping. Now, you remember what I said? Because his spoon, well, I'm not even going to point where it got stuck. But really, they did not know each other before this. But I tell you, they are still together to this very day. Cruising just really touches me, you know? It really touches me. Anyone ever done this one before? Okay, very quickly, this is what happens. The crew staff finds three ladies in the crowd and they don't know what figuratively and literally they're getting into. Once they place these three ladies on the stage, the crew staff brings a pair of long red johns that each lady must get into. Then the crew staff goes out and finds three gentlemen that do not know those ladies, brings them up, places one by each lady. The crew staff then gives each guy a large sack of balloons. <laughs> You really get this, don't you? Oh, it's you. You have a great laugh. You can come here anytime. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I give the cue to the orchestra to start playing the band music, each guy must have to stuff the red long johns of their lady with as many balloons as possible before the music stops. It's not a lot of time, so they've got to act very quickly. Oh. It's just so exciting. Oh, yes. And then, when the music stops, I come along with a very long, sharp hat pin, and I count by popping how many balloons are in each outfit. And I know you're going to get this. I can feel it in the depths of my soul. The couple that wins with the most balloons in her red long johns wins a cheap bottle. Oh, I love you people. I love you people. Anybody ever sail on a Greek cruise ship before? A Greek cruise ship, yes. So those of you that have, you'll probably know that the best night of entertainment on those cruises happens to be when your Greek crew gets up and performs songs and dances from Greece. What I didn't know when I cruise directed my very first Greek cruise ship was the fact that the cruise director who most likely is not Greek, has to MC this evening's extravaganza. Anybody ever study Greek in school? Those words are like Russian or German. They're endless and very difficult to pronounce. And as a cruise director, I felt it was my duty to get the crew names and their songs and dances in Greek correct. Well, I got that, but nothing prepared me. Here's another confession for what was going to happen that night when I emceed my very first Greek night cruise show. So, lounge packed, standing room only. As we had rehearsed so many times before, the lights dimmed, 
The overture was played by the orchestra, never on Sunday, right, to fit in with the theme. And then in the darkness, I would come out on the stage, go to where the mic stand was, center stage, the spotlight would hit me, I would take the mic from the mic stand, and that night I said, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Greek Night Cruise Show, and my skirt dropped. <laughs> What you might not be able to tell by this photo, and this is the national cultural costume for men in Greece, right? Tights that look solid, but in my case, they were not. A skirt that I kid you not is nine yards long that wraps around and you have a sash to tie it. Well, I must not have tied the sash very tight. And I did not even know that my skirt had dropped until I started to feel a draft. <laughs> and then I kind of felt where the draft was that I was feeling. And I looked down and I saw the skirt around my ankles and immediately looked up. And I kid you not, about 50 flash bulbs went off all around the lounge. A night I will never, ever forget. Quick question, folks. Can anybody guess the year of the very first cruise? The year of the very first cruise. How about this? I've got the day and the year. December 17th, 1784. 1784, you see how old Bingo really is? <laughs> that was eight years after what was signed in this country? the Declaration of Independence. It was a French ship. Ships, of course, were the main mode of transport between 1874 all the way to 1958. What happened in 1958 that literally took the wind out of the sails of the cruise industry? Airplanes, the Boeing 707. Why? Because when people realized that they could get from London to New York in five hours instead of five days, the cruise line industry was sunk until 1974, uh, 79, actually. I think I heard somebody say it. What happened in 1979 that literally put the wind back into the sails of the cruise industry? The love boat. The love boat. Now, how many of you will even dare to admit that you've seen at least one episode of The Love Boat. <laughs> Wonderful. You remember the theme song? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you remember it, how does it go? Sing it for me. <laughs> oh my God. I feel like I'm on the Titanic, actually. <laughs> Okay, well, you, you get the idea. What cruise line did the love boat have to Princess. deal with? Princess, right? Get this, folks. At any time that the love boat was on TV, it had no less than 30 million viewers. On any princess ship, 18% of the passenger compliment came to cruise on a princess ship because of the love boat. Each weekly episode of that show was worth over eight million dollars to the cruise industry. How many of you remember seeing David Letterman on The Late Show? Quite a bit of you. Remember he had his top 10 list? Well, us cruise directors, another amazing confession for you, have an actual top 13 list of real questions that passengers such as yourselves ask cruise directors such as me. Are you ready? Real questions. Question number 13. Does the crew really sleep on board? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How about number 12? Will the trap shooting contest be held out of doors? <laughs> number 11, real questions. Has this ship ever sunk? <laughs> number 10. I love this. Can you tell me, please, if this elevator goes to the front of the ship? <laughs> Number nine, what time is the midnight buffet? <laughs> Number eight, how far above sea level are we? <laughs> Number seven, can you tell me, please, why did those darn Greeks build so many ruins? <laughs> Number six, what do you guys do with all of those ice carvings after they melt? 
Number five, is this island totally surrounded by water? <laughs> oh, yes. Number four, will I get wet if I go snorkeling? <laughs> Number three, standing before the photos of the captain's welcome aboard cocktail party, you know, the photo boards where you go to find them, somebody says to me, how do we know which photos are ours? <laughs> oh, you gotta love people, you know? Number two, do you know what time that volcano will erupt? I want to be sure to capture it on my cell phone. And number one, a question that I got more often than not. Robert, can you tell me if those stairs go up? <laughs> what you think happens, what every ship captain knows, your mind can be your best friend or your worst enemy, right? Think about that. And one of the reasons why it often works against you is this, mind chatter, right? We have so many thousands of thoughts each and every day. 70% of those thoughts are negative. But they don't have to be. That's a choice. My question to you is, are you your mind chatter or are you something more? Talking to yourself within yourself makes a huge difference in how your day unfolds. This is what I do every morning, and it really works. Before my big toe hits the floor of my master bedroom suite, I say to myself while I'm still in bed, Robert, today, no matter what happens, you are going to have an incredible day. And if stuff comes up, it will be okay. Do you think that makes a difference in someone's day? Yes. It really does. Yes. And science is starting to prove that to be the case. The great Bruce Lee said, what you habitually think largely determines what you will ultimately become. You are in control of situations more often than you give yourself credit for. It comes down to this, and this is all stuff I've learned at sea. Are you an innocent victim going through life's circumstance? Or might you just be a willing co-creator? Hmm. Are you the captain of your ship? Or when stuff happens, do you freak out, let go of the wheel of your ship, and just let someone else steer it for you? And if you do that, you have lost control of your ship. Person ex personal example, that's me as a kid. That's my father. My father was a very famous symphony orchestra conductor, very effervescent guy, brilliant speaker, master athlete on the podium, amazing creative artist. And when you grow up in the shadow of somebody like that, you got a choice. You either emulate that and say, wow, I can do that, or you kind of say, oh my god, all I want to do is cower in your shadow. And I chose the latter. I was heavily teased and bullied in school all the way through to junior high school. And one of the reasons was my parents came from Eastern Europe. He from Germany, she from Romania. And they weren't aware of what it was to raise kids in this country in those days. So they dressed my brother and I in very bright colors. And I was teased relentlessly about that to where I started to view myself through all those other kids' eyes, I let go of the wheel of my ship. Many years later, I woke up one day and said, now wait a minute, that's their impression of me. What is my impression of myself? And might there be a difference? And I said, oh yes, there was. So I decided to become an actor. Scary for someone who could not get up in front of two people and say one word many years before. It's a question of saying, okay, nobody's going to steer this ship, my ship, but me. Am I up to the challenge? Because that's what I came here to do. So put your captain's cap on, grab a hold of the wheel, and hold on tight. 
How to thrive in difficult situations. Let's talk a little bit about that, and I'd like to preface this section by this. A smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. Look at this, folks. This is a book you can still get on Amazon or in the public library. It's called The Wreck of the Titan, written by a guy called Morgan Richard, uh, Robertson. It is an unusual novel describing the doomed voyage of a luxury liner in this book. It's a novel by the name of Titan. In the book, the Titan is the largest and most glamorous liner ever constructed, carrying the wealthy and prominent of her time on her April maiden voyage between Southampton, England, and New York. She sets out to break a nautical speed record, but in the middle of the night, the Titan strikes an iceberg and sinks, killing most of the passengers on board as a result of an insufficient number of lifeboats. Get this, folks. The Wreck of the Titan was published in 1898, 14 years before the tragedy of the Titanic occurred. How does that happen? I had something kind of similar happen to me that I'd like to share with you. Uh, it's this, Hurricane Emily. I was in the middle of cruise directing a wonderful seven-day cruise series between New York and Bermuda. Get this, cruisers. You would sail past the Statue of Liberty leaving the island of Manhattan on Saturday. Spend Sunday at sea going to Bermuda. Monday, you would wake up and you would see the beautiful islands of Bermuda on the coastline because we were going to go through some narrows for an hour to pull up to, pull alongside, Hamilton, Bermuda, Bermuda's capital, Front Street, their Fifth Avenue, and we would stay pulled up alongside, tied up alongside Front Street Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and leave Thursday at 2 p.m., go through an hour of those narrows, right? And then Friday at sea to return to Manhattan Saturday morning. Incredible, because during all those days in Bermuda, you don't have to worry about going from island to island or being back to the ship after just four hours of visiting somewhere. The ship was your hotel. One of those weeks, the captain, Mario Palumbo, calls me up to the bridge, and he says, Robert, it's Wednesday. We're not, as you know, supposed to leave here until Thursday, but there is a disastrous hurricane at sea by the name of Emily, and um, she's not headed towards Bermuda, but we're gonna keep an eye on her. And I said, okay, I'm gonna go back to my cabin and take a rest before the evening activities begin. And as soon as my head hit the pillow, my phone rings in my cabin and it's Captain Palombo asking me to come back to the bridge immediately. I come back to the bridge and this normally jovial guy has a very sullen expression on his face. And I said, Captain, what's wrong? And he said, Robert, Emily has changed course. She is headed for downtown Bermuda Front Street. How can we get all of our passengers back within 60 minutes? Because we need to get out of here now because we have an hour's worth of narrows to go through. I thought, I don't know. You're the captain, for God's sake. So what he decided to do was press the ship's whistle. And you know how loud that can be, right? And he did it every three seconds for 20 minutes. Bermuda is not one island. It's a whole series of islands in an arc. But word spread from island to island. We got all of our passengers back, but not in enough time to sail out of those narrows. We weathered Hurricane Emily tied up alongside the pier, a place a cruise ship should never be when there's a hurricane. So I was on the bridge for this, and the hurricane arrives, and I'm watching the wind meter on the bridge go a little nuts right? But the winds were so powerful that we were leaning into the pier, and it seemed to be okay. Then the eye passes over. Blue skies makes you want to go to the beach. Then what happened? It came back twice as fierce 
as it had first arrived. Now, I'm watching the wind meter go absolutely crazy. The ship now is being blown away from the pier, and we are leaning this way. We were leaning at such an angle that we snapped all of those thick lines that kept us secure around the ballast into the, the cement of the pier. And what lines we didn't snap, we pulled the ballast out of the concrete. And now, without the engines running, we were loose in this very narrow, small, secluded bay with an island in the center of it with a large rock coming out of the water. The captain was Italian. This was an Italian cruise line. Italians can be very emotional, and he lost it. He lost control of his ship. It was quite astounding. We actually swung towards that rock and hit it. And we didn't know how big the gash was in the hull of the ship. This really makes you want to take another cruise, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. And to make matters worse, at least the captain had been able to communicate with his officers and these anchors of the front and the aft section of the ship were dropped. So now at least we were secure in that shallow bay, but the winds were still howling and we were still leaning at such an angle that I thought, okay, when this ship does tip over, I'm gonna open this bridge door and I'm gonna get all of my passengers out through this bridge door onto the side of the ship so we can be rescued. You could smell death. I'm watching palm trees roll down Front Street, people's roofs uh, being eliminated by the shingle blowing away. And all I could think about, this was amazing to me because I didn't consider myself to be a very spiritual person then. This is what I did. When I thought all was lost, and I really felt that I started to say out loud, in the midst of all of this mayhem on the bridge, love will save the day. Love will save the day. And I thought, where is this coming from? And I kept saying it louder and louder like a mantra. Love will save the day. Love will save the day. Everybody say it. Love will save the day. And sure enough, the storm passed, the sun came out, the ship righted itself back up, and all of us senior officers were just on the bridge in silence, in shock. We got out of the narrows, barely. The gash in the hull was not severe enough to where it penetrated, so we didn't take on any water. But look at this. The ship's photographer took this. We pulled the ballast here out of the pier when we broke away from it during the storm. Every newspaper, particularly in New York and on the East Coast, we were the big story. The big story because of what had happened in Bermuda that day. Let's go a number of years later, a couple of Januaries ago, to another island, this one off the coast of Italy, with a huge rock protruding off the side of it. I think some of you know what I'm getting to. The Costa Concordia with Costa Cruise Line, another Italian cruise line. That captain was a little different than Captain Mario Palumbo, who had saved our lives that day and was rewarded because he did so. This guy's name was Captain Scatino. And what he was in the process of doing when he sailed into that port that night was he knew a mentor of his, a, a, a retired captain, had a summer villa on that Italian island. And Captain Scatino wanted to show off. Why? Because his girlfriend, who was part of the entertainment package, allegedly was on the bridge that night. And he wanted to show off. What he didn't realize was that he got a little too close to that rock that was sticking out of that side of the island, and his ship hit it. It tore a huge gash into the hull of that ship. It started to tip over. It started to take on water, and it was a major disaster to where a number of days after the disaster, it looked like this. 30 people lost their lives because of that captain's ineptness that day. When the captain, uh-huh, yes, that's exactly true. When the captain was found ashore by the 
Italian Coast Guard captain, it was still before all of the passenger staff and crew had been evacuated from the Costa Concordia. So here comes lifeboat after lifeboat of passengers, and then another lifeboat that the Coast Guard captain sees just has two people in it, the captain and another crew member. And the Coast Guard captain says to Captain Scatino, excuse me, are you the captain of that ship? And Captain Scatino says, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Coast Guard, and I won't repeat the language, says, what the heck are you doing off the ship? You have broken maritime law. You never leave a ship before your staff, your passengers, your officers and crew are off. What are you doing here? You know what he allegedly said? Well, <laughs> you won't believe this, but I was walking down the deck in the midst of all this mayhem, and I tripped, and I fell into a lifeboat. And you know what? Here I am. Of course, national media coverage happened. <laughs> the New York Post, in its own inimitable way, represented the event like this. This is exactly what the, the uh, uh, Coast Guard off, uh, captain said to him. How about this? I love this. Captain Scatino started his new job as a bus driver today. <laughs> I repeat, women and children first. But he is already off the ship. There's a very interesting missing piece to this story, another confession that I haven't shared with you that I, that I hope you'll find interesting. I'm sitting in the woodlands, right, watching all of this on TV, and as the media so often does, it chooses to give bad press to now all Italian ship captains. And I thought, well, that's not fair. There was a guy by the name of Captain Mario Palumbo who saved my life when his ship hit a rock off an island in Bermuda. I'm gonna do something about this. That's Captain Mario Palumbo, by the way, right? So, what did I do? I decided, <laughs> go for the gusto, Robert, why not? I picked up the phone and I called CNN headquarters in Atlanta. And I said, hi, uh, my name is Robert Landau. I'm a retired cruise director and I have a personal connection to the Costa Concordia. You wanna know what it was? Guess who the retired ship captain was whose summer villa was on that Italian island? Captain Mario Palumbo. Mm -hmm. Captain Scatino was trying to impress his mentor, Mario Palumbo, and I could not rest because I didn't want Mario Palumbo to get bad publicity. So here I am on the phone with CNN. They decided, okay, let's give him over to a news producer. I spoke to a news producer and they said, oh, Mr. Landau, can you tell us where you're calling from? And I said, sure, a suburb of Houston. And they said, oh, how fast can you get to downtown Houston? And I said, well, 40 minutes. And they said, good. We have a live show on our sister network, the HLN network tonight, on the Costa Concordia disaster. We would like you to appear live on this show. And I thought, oh my God, I'm having a bad hair day. That's impossible. <laughs> I did, though. It was an amazing experience. Vinny Napolitan interviewed me live around the world on the CNN sister network, and I got to defend the right of Italian cruise ship captains. So when your ship hits a rock and it's going down, how do you choose to behave? Do you behave like Captain Mario Scatino? and not defend the right of your beingness and your ship? Or are you like the Italian maritime captain ashore who says, excuse me, I'm more of a captain than you are. Get back on your ship and do your job. Or are you more like the chief purser of the Costa Concordia who was found three days after they thought they had taken everybody off that ship he was found in water up to his chin. He was left to die. And when they found him, what had happened was he gave his life vest to a senior gentleman passenger who couldn't find his. 
And while the, the hotel manager, the chief purser, was trying to get off the ship, he got himself caught in some furniture because the ship was at such an angle and couldn't free himself and water started to come up. He was there for three days. And so when he got to shore, the press was there. And they asked him this very important question. They said, sir, can you tell us what you were thinking of while you were waiting to die? And you know what he said? I never once lost sight of the fact that I would live to see my family another day. If you think it and you believe it and you have faith in it and you trust it, it will be so. Okay. So, a couple more things before we close. Look at this. Ships don't sink because of the water around them. Ships sink because of the water that gets in them. Don't let what happens around you get inside you to weigh you down. Stay up. Stay up. So, a couple of things before we close. Uh, this particularly. I want you to always remember that you are the captain of your ship. You are. We have all been through some horrific storms at sea, haven't we? Each one of us, right? And we may go through some more. But I want you to be the lighthouse in the center of any storm that happens to make itself known to you. Are you the storm or are you the lighthouse that can weather any storm? Think about it. Lighthouses are built strong to withstand those waves. That is you. But it's one thing hearing about this. You got to believe it. You got to resonate with what I'm saying. Be the calm in the center of the storm. And you, just like me, can get through any and everything. Here's a closer for you, a final true confession. My last cruise was with a wonderful cruise line called Renaissance Cruise Line. And we had a very short cruise in Asia, which finished in Tokyo. Uh, and just after the last passenger got off the ship, because I always stood at the gangway, kind of like I greeted you here today, to say goodbye to the passengers, they were being bused, all Americans, from the pier in Tokyo to the international airport there to fly home. And just as I was going to leave to take a shower, I hear somebody calling my name frantically. Robert, Robert, wait, 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 wait don't leave, don't leave, please. And I look to see where this is coming from, and I look down one of our very long hallways where the suites were, and this is a cabin stewardess named Inga coming at me, yelling this, and I notice that she's holding something. And when she gets closer to me, she's all out of breath, and she goes, oh my God, Robert, Robert, I'm so glad you're still here. I was cleaning my last suite, and the wonderful lady that was in there, well, she left something in there, and I was hoping to bring it to her because I was hoping the bus hadn't left yet with her on it. Did it? And I said, yes, Inga. I'm very sorry to say that it did. And I looked down to see what she was holding. It was a little black book. And I said, Inga, what is that? She goes, well, I kind of hate to tell you, Robert, but it's her diary. <laughs> and I said, oh, she left her diary in the suite. And now it's too late to get it to her because that bus is probably at the airport. But as an officer of this ship, Inga, I am sworn to ask you the following question because that's her diary. Did you look at it? <laughs> she was horrified and she goes, Robert, Robert, I've been a cabin stewardess with Renaissance Cruise Line for many years. You know that I would never, ever do that. And I said, good, Inga. I figured, give me the diary because I'll take a look. <laughs> so with her kind permission, this lady, here are the six days of that cruise according to this lady's diary. Day number one, she writes, this is a marvelous ship. I love the sunshine and I'm going to have a great cruise. Mm -hmm. Day number two goes like this. 
So many men seem to be so very interested in me that I really don't know which one to pick. <laughs> I love this ship, and I'm having a great cruise. Day number three. I met the orchestra leader today, and we had a couple of drinks. He made advances, but I made retreats. But you know what? He's a real nice guy anyway. I love the ship, and I'm having a great cruise. Day number four, she writes this. Today, I had drinks with that orchestra leader again. He asked me to his cabin and said that he wanted me in a passionate way. I refused. But I love the ship, and I'm having a great cruise. Day number five, according to her diary, she writes this. Today, the orchestra leader told me he loved me. He also said that unless I gave in to his demands, that he would blow up this ship and sink it to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> He's so funny. You know, I really like his style. <laughs> day number six. Last and final day of the cruise, she writes this. Today, I feel so relieved. Last night, I saved the lives of over 2,000 passengers. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. God bless. Thank you so much.